Um, so, yeah, firstly, who of you are familiar with an image like that? Have you ever seen it before? I see like head shaking, not one raised hand. Right, that's an open data license. This talk is um, open licensed as well. Like you can, you can read there what the license is. You can use these slides. You don't need to ask me for permission. Just please, you know, attribute um, this talk. Right, so it is quite concerning that no, you know, nobody seems to be aware of this kind of thing and like, this is what this talk is all about. As Poloshi said in his talk, Sandy has got a, a data management mandate that largely sort of follows on Sandy's bigger mandate to monitor and report on the state of biodiversity in the country. We can't really do that, obviously, without data. So, um, <clears throat> and our mandate is quite broad. Uh, and yeah, Poloshi gave a very good sort of detailed presentation on how that relates to uh, management of taxonomy, for example. But really, like I see Sandy not as a research institution, but as a research infrastructure. If you look at the scope of what we need to do, um, and sort of this is uh, against the, the, the types of, of research infrastructures that exist globally. Many of them are concerned just with collecting and organizing data, um, or to promote data discovery. Um, so I'm not sure if you've ever heard of Data One, for example, that's a metadata portal that purely serves metadata. You don't get data, but they tell you what kind of data is available globally, and then you can go to those data sources to find it. You get some research um, infrastructures that provide platforms for analysis. So basically it's a, like a virtual lab. You can come with your ingredients, your data sets. They've got nice machinery um, that you can, can you know, crunch your, your data for you and, and um, you go away and, and write up your results. Um, <clears throat> some infrastructures are purely interested in data preservation and, and some provide platforms for collaboration, training and education. Sandy does bits of all of these, um, but the part that I'm most uh, interested in and what my responsibility revolves around is around aggregating data so that Sandy and other institutions can use the, the power of um, you know, data from, from various sources. Right. And when I talk about you know, the scope of that data, well, she gave an example of all from a species perspective starts out with a taxonomic backbone. So currently Sandy's got over you know, 30 different checklists. We've got a master checklist for plants, but there's various different ones for animals. All of the people working on animal research knows the problems um, you know, within those various families. And it's important for us that that sort of um, backbone needs coordination and that there is a national master checklist um, that, that all data can be referenced against. Um, and then the other kinds of data for, for animals uh, <coughs> are you know, the um, descriptive information, right? The taxonomic descriptive information, but then also conservation status, for example, that we would get through through red list programs, etc. Or in the case of invasives, legal status confirmation, uh, uh, information in terms of its legal categories, etc. Um, <clears throat> other information like images, and um, Alias talk about iNaturalist as one of our, our image sources, for example, and then also very importantly, spatial information. Um, you know, biodiversity, well, I, I think all data, even data in somebody's head, can be geolocated somewhere on and represented spatially um, on the planet. Uh, but biodiversity information in particular sort of obviously lends itself to spatial representation and analysis um, and then uh, publications associated with that. And Sam is interested in all of that kind of species data, aggregating it. So if you are sitting there as a potential data partner, sitting with that kind of data, just know that I am interested in sort of signing you up and making that data available. Um, there are technological hurdles to that at, the, at, at this point in time, but that is our interest. And it's the same on the ecosystem side. For ecosystem data, there's also a classification system for each realm associated with the same kind of information as for species. But then we're also interested in information on the pressures on, on biodiversity. And yeah, uh, talks earlier in the session focused quite well um, on that. What we don't deal with at this point is genetic information because the, the infrastructures that deal with that are global infrastructures, really, GenBank, <coughs> Eyeball, etc. Um, and also archives of research experiments. I mean, there are in every university, in every museum, there are lots, lots and lots of data that sits sort of in your know, research experiments on old computers, 
um, that aren't properly indexed. Uh, and yeah, there's a mountain to climb before we even get to that. So the kind of data that we currently hold, uh, yeah, you can see there from um, records, checklists, uh, <coughs> yeah, um, specimen images, etc., etc. It, it, it is quite a significant repository, but that's not Sandy's data. That data comes from data partners. There are 20, I think it's 29 big ones, uh, but literally yeah, hundreds of data partners down to whom course from Yakult's contain like sends us his checklist of what's on his farm when it's regarded as a data partner, right? And not all of this data is open. Um, our colleague from the city of Cape Town raised issues around sort of concerns people have around open data, data they don't want to share, etc. Um, but we want all data to be as open as possible. And like, that's a little um, you know, flag I hang out there, you can ask me questions about later. Right? <clears throat> but globally there's a drive towards open data. I mean, I'll pick two publications here that sums it up the most um, you know, eloquently for me, but there are lots of publications that document this drive in the natural sciences um, and you know, <clears throat> publicly funded natural science globally uh, towards open data. That is all encapsulated under the FAIR principles, which you can read more about, but it's it essentially, it says there that data should be findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. And I'll talk a bit about that for the rest of, in, in the rest of this talk, right? Um, South Africa has signed up at its highest level to open data policies. So the Department of Science and Technology, now Science and Innovation, fund two massive research infrastructure programs um, that Sandy coordinates. The one is the FBIP, and are there anybody here that are FBIP grant recipients? Yeah. There's a couple, I thought there would be more. Um, yeah, where effectively you get grants to do research, but um, the proviso is that, that data, the data that comes out of that research must be open data. Right, so, and all, secondly, um, yeah, uh, the DSI also funds the Natural Science Collections Facility, which is assisting museums, herbariums throughout the country effectively to start managing their collections better, of which a big part is digitizing their collections so that we don't sit with a kind of um, disaster that befell Brazil uh, yeah, almost a year ago now, I think. All right. <clears throat> so, yeah, and there's significant amount of data that are being generated through those through those projects, right? And the benefit of all of this data doesn't sit at the individual research project. That's great for the individual researcher or research unit, um, but it really sits at aggregating those data and at its highest level into these national kind of initiatives like we've seen um, through the IPCC and, and under the CBD, etc. So you can see, for example, um, in this report that you know, over 380 million occurrence records were used to support the, the latest IPCC report, biodiversity records, right? But to work at that scale, um, data needs to be human and machine readable. You can't have a human analyzing 380 million records. Right? And, <clears throat> and when humans work with data sets, it's, it's, relatively easy, or it's relatively easy to figure it out, right? You can you know, look at different data sets, start comparing them, um, and start you know, unifying those data sets into one, but it, it is extremely painful. Machines can't do that at all. For a machine for data to be readable, you basically, the structure of that data needs to be the same. You need to predefine the relationships between um, different data elements, and it basically means that you need a data standard. And as a community, we suck at implementing data standards. Most of us, to undertake our research projects thinking about what we need the data for, you develop your own Excel spreadsheet in most cases of how you want to store the data, right? and like that's it. Five years down the line, somebody else wants to come and use your data, and it is a difficult task you know, for them. Often, you, know, um, you, you, know, you just have the data set uh, in many cases where, like in, in my case, I didn't complete my master's, so there's no technical report to go along with it, etc. If anybody other than me looks at that data, they can't really use it. They've got to make guesses. 
Um, and this is something that pains me especially because at Sandy I'm also responsible for biodiversity planning. And you would not believe the amount of potentially good data that I've had to chuck aside just because I can't understand sort of what the limitations of that data is, you know, um, you know, how it was gathered, etc., etc. So my mantra is that what we need is we need complicated rights for easy reads. And that might sound like gibberish to you, but it basically means that creating data needs to be more difficult than using the data. Right? And this is something that across our sector we struggle with. Somebody wants to do a red list assessment, how much data cleaning do you need to do before you can even start? Right? It's like, and we go around that mill every couple of years when the next assessment needs to get done. Like we waste tons of money and effort, etc. simply because you know, we want easy rights that result in complicated reads of data. Okay. So, but we do have a mountain to climb and my appeal is just where we need to start is we just need to start with better metadata. Right? And that's data about our, about our data. Um, <clears throat> and at its simplest, Metadata will help us with data discoverability. So you write up what your data set is about. Right? Your metadata gets exposed to the internet, so when somebody searches for it, they can actually find your data and then figure out whether it's useful to them. And secondly, um, <clears throat> your metadata provides us with context for linking that, met linking that data object, so your data set, to other things that are related to that data, so to pictures if your data set is about a specific um, species, right? It can be linked to pictures of those species, or it can be linked to publications about those species. Um, but also, metadata needs to be simple. What I find often is people try to cut corners with metadata, so they just cut and paste something out of the, you know, out of the paper or the technical report. But metadata needs to be simple, it needs to explain you know, your data, not sort of just be a carbon copy of it. So if you haven't read that book, read it, it's awesome. The author used the thousand most common words in the English language to explain a range of things, like cell phones, for example, right? which he calls a hand computer. Right? Um, and because that's what your metadata needs to do, it needs to ex explain your data in relatively simple terms so that people can pick it up. Right? But so what this means for us, for Sandy and, and for our community of data partners in particular, uh, is that we need to you know, reorientate ourselves towards this. Right? Sandy sits with data that was collected, you know, right? <clears throat> you know, some of it you know, over 100 years ago, and for most of the, the data sets we have now, we received them before <coughs> the internet was you know, the, the sharing platform that it is now. Right? So when Um Kurs gave us his data, he thought he was giving it to Fela Raimondo to do a red list assessment. He wasn't aware that that data set can now be served to somebody you know, in Bolivia who is interested in you know, and what give us on his farm. Right, so we need to go out and conclude new data sharing agreements, and <clears throat> um, which we will start doing shortly sort of with our community. And to address the concerns from our colleague from the city of Cape Town, our data sharing agreements provide for three categories of, of um, data sharing with Sandy that basically sort of decreases or, or with the level of restriction or makes the data look more open. I want all data partners to subscribe to the, 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 the green level there, category three, which basically allows Sandy to publish that data to any other platforms that we see to be useful in the most useful form. Isambelo will never uh, give us that level of permission. I know that they'll sit somewhere between category one and two. Um, at least until we become sort of a trusted repository for them. Um, but this is if, but there's effectively a massive drive that we need to undertake um, to, you know, to collectively sort of become educated in the space and orientate ourselves towards sharing our data. Right? And from Sandy's side, the one thing that we absolutely need to improve is attribution. So kind of what I had on the opening slide is Sandy is all also sucked at attributing our data partners properly. People always think that all of those data, all of that data is Sandy's data, it's not. It's our partner's data and we need to give people and institutions better recognition. Um, <clears throat> and in terms of what uh, data partners need to do, is they obviously need to walk that road with us. To, for each data set that you've ever shared with us and ever will share with us again, 
You need to pick the level of restriction appropriate to that data set. Right? You need to fill in proper metadata for your data, data sets. And ideally fix bad data if anybody points it out. This is actually a legal requirement in terms of our legislation. Um, <clears throat> yeah. And then lastly, um, give us permission to share any personal information that might be included in, in that data. This is also a legal requirement that I can talk about yeah, on its own in, in a lot more detail. Right. But then, yeah, as I said, the primary issues of concern is that we still lack a data sharing culture largely. Um, and the world is moving ahead without us. I'll, you know, this is the last slide that I'll stop on. And I think what, what researchers especially needs to become aware of is that at, even attribution is being increasingly moved away from. Because if you are doing an uh, analysis where you use data from a thousand different papers, you can't cite those papers anymore. Like your citation will be longer than your actual paper. Right? So the EU have, have led this charge, the US is, is slightly behind it, where, you said it, where especially publicly funded scientific data um, is being regarded as a public resource that doesn't need citation. They still recommend that, that obviously if you just have free data sources, give, give them attribution and recognition where it's required. But yeah, the, the world is becoming more and more focused on, on the potential for big data use um, and not the obstacles. And then dealing with restricted data is always an issue. That's not the same as sensitive data. And that will be data where somebody gives us a data set and says, under no circumstances can you share this with anyone. Not even um, if they invoke your know, access to information, legislation, etc. And, and the law also does provide for that. But how to automate this is something that we still need to improve. Right. And yeah, that's it. Thank you.